Are you ready? See you, Brett. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. We're back for another episode of Fireside Chat and probably our last episode before the entry draft, unless something big happens. And this week, uh, we're going to be breaking down the rest of the draft. Last week, we talked about round one and what the Flames might do with the 15th pick. And this week, we'll be talking about rounds two through seven. And to help me, as always, is uh, my co-host, Matt. How you doing, buddy? Awesome. Thrilled to have more draft talk. It's good, isn't it? And especially in a deep draft like this, it's a lot of fun to talk about. Yeah, it's nice that the Flames have six picks to deal with in the top 90. So they'll be walking away with quite a few good players. And before we came on the air tonight, you and I were looking at uh, the Flames drafting history, and there have been some terrible Calgary Flames drafts in the past. Like just years where we've just had awful picks all the way from top to bottom. And we've seen that turn around in about 2010 is when it started to change. I think that this is a draft that's going to stay on that upward trajectory of probably having you know good depth right from uh, round one right all the way through round six or seven. Yeah, I can see it, and there's a lot of good players that have some issues deeper in the draft, but they do have talent, so I wouldn't be surprised this year if some of the players that are drafted in rounds 5 through 7 end up becoming star players like Andre Palat. Well, let's jump right into it then, and let's start with round two of the entry draft. And this year, the Flames are fortunate enough to have three picks in the in the second round. Uh, the Flames hold their own pick, at, which will be the 45th overall pick. They also have the 52nd overall pick, which they got from the Washington Capitals in exchange for Curtis Glencross. And the pick right after it, as it turns out, the 53rd overall pick, which we got from the Canucks in exchange for Berchi. So before we get into players who you think will be available at uh, 45, we'll do these all as one group, kind of the 45 through 53. Matt, are there any players, say, between the 20 and 35 range you think might fall into that 45th spot? Well, I could definitely see a guy like Olivier Kylington or uh, Daniel Sprong. We mentioned last week that they do have issues, and it might be turn out that they might fall to 45 if not uh them a guy like Denis Garanoff who talent wise is a top 10 top 15 pick but because he's Russian some teams might shy away that might be another possibility of a really talented player sliding into the 45 range and because we have three picks in the second round we can probably afford to be um a little bit less conservative with those picks and maybe take a flyer or a player who we're uncertain of. Yeah, and there's a lot of talent in the second round. Like, it's not like most years where, you know, if you get somebody that might be a third, fourth line guy, you're doing good. Like, this draft, there are players that you could end up getting a first line star player even in the 50 to 60 range. Excellent news, considering that we're picking three times there. Yeah. Well, let's t- let's jump in then and talk about some of the guys you've highlighted who you've done uh, reviews on. And as we mentioned last week, all these players, we have a write-up about them at firesidechat.ca. It's a simple introduction to the player. You'll get to see a video. You'll get some of their basic stats. You'll see a pro of co- and con of why we should pick them and maybe why we shouldn't. And also Matt's take out of 10 on uh, how bullish he is on the Flames taking that player. So if you're not familiar with these guys and you just want a quick introduction to the player, that's a great place to go. So thanks for doing that, Matt. I know that takes you a lot of time every year. Yeah, it's fun. I I like to familiarize myself with the draft anyway, just so I have more knowledge. And I figure, well, I'm doing the work anyway, so why not share it with everybody? Well, let's start with uh, the first guy on the list, another forward, a left wing slash center as he's been listed, uh, Anthony Beauvillier, and he plays in the QMJHL. He played for Schwinnigan last year, uh, six, seven games played, 43 goals, 52 assists for 94 points, and he's 5'10 and 173 pounds. Matt, what can you tell us about this player? 
Uh, he's an interesting player. A couple years ago, there was a player that was taken by the Los Angeles Kings, Jordan Wheel, and he was also a dynamic offensive player, and he had a similar height issue to Beauvillier. And because of that, he ended up sliding down right through to 70th, I do believe, even oh. though he was rated in like the 30 to 35 range. And because Beauvillier is similarly short at 5'10", he might also fall. Like, I think he's rated in the 35-ish range uh, around the various sites. But he could easily fall to 45 as well, even though stat-wise he shouldn't. You're thinking just because of the size he might fall? Yeah, because yeah, some teams, they still would, especially in a year like this where there are bigger players that are skilled, they might opt to go that way. Beauvillier, he's very fast, very good shot, good overall potential. Like, I would not be shocked if he emerged as a first-line player down the road. It's just that because of his height, some people might shy away. One thing I've noticed about him from the clips I've watched is he seems to be a very smart player. He's He plays efficiently. He doesn't try to go out of his way to do just, you know, big moves and big plays for the sake of doing them. But he's really smart. He knows kind of the best course of action to take with the least amount of effort for the maximum gain, I guess, would be the best way of saying it. Yeah, and... Uh, he's a pretty good all the way around offensive player. Uh, it would likely take him three or four years to actually put on the proper amount of weight in order to be an NHL player, but he should be a good one when he gets there. And we've seen the Flames have had success um, with this player in the past, and uh, or not with this player, sorry, but with players of this stature, I guess, in the past. Yeah, exactly. Like with Johnny Gaudreau being the most notable Johnny Gaudreau, example. I'd say even I'd say even Byron uh last yeah, year the Flames enough. showed you know they showed that they're okay with those smaller players yeah and um, realistically like in a draft like this getting just a raw talent should be priority number one and Beauvillier if he was say 6-1 or 6-2 he'd probably be in the top 15 what do you think the likelihood is that for a guy who's expected to go in the kind of low 30s that he would be available at 45? Because of his height, I could I would actually be somewhat surprised if he wasn't on the board. It, just because of the fact that usually you around the middle 30s you start seeing goaltenders being taken. That's true. Yeah, like last year, um, like Mason McDonald, he wasn't even rated to go in the second round, and yet he went 34th, and then you saw like four goalies go right after him. So, and this draft's kind of similar, where you have a bunch of decent goaltenders, not spectacular, but good. Uh, I could see teams in that 30 to 40 range take some, especially uh, teams like, say, like the Oilers, if I don't know if they even have a second round pick, but you know, yeah, what I don't mean? know like where they, they don't could have, definitely use some help. Yeah, where they don't have a goaltender, it, that wouldn't be a bad idea for those teams to do that. All right, well let's uh, let's take a look at the the next guy on your list, another winger. This is a theme, as I guess as it is every year, um, we get a lot of you know forwards in every draft. A uh, right winger, Jas- Jack Roslevic. Um, and he has played this year for the uh, U.S. National Development Team, and he's on his way to Miami University in the NCAA next year. He's a centerman and right winger, 18 years old, six foot one, 183 pounds. This is another guy who's expected to go in the 30s. Some have even predicted he might go in the first round. What's so special about this player that he might go that high? Well, he his stats are a little inflated because he's playing with the player that's expected to go number one overall next year, Austin Matthews. So that's why his stats are otherworldly in comparison to most prospects. But uh, he's a good player. He could fall because some teams think might think that he's not as good as his line mate. So that you know he's riding Matthews coattails so 
if he is available, he's good enough in his own right that he would be worth uh, the pick at 45. Now, you've said that in any other year when the draft isn't so stacked, you think that uh, this player might be in the top 20. So he's, uh, he you think would, he's that? If, he was, if this was, say, last year, he would have been selected around 22, give or take. Okay. So that's still a very good player then. Oh, yeah. It, there, it, there's not a lot that you can complain about him. It's just that his stats are a little deceptive because of his line mate. And in your review, you also said that uh, some of the cons about him, one is that he's a little over-exuberant when he scores, and one's that he'll be headed to the NCAA, so he won't be ready for three to four years. I don't know if that's necessarily a disadvantage. I think especially if the player needs some development time, that can be a good thing for their development. True. It's just that some people, like you, we've seen on Calgary Puck and other places, the ongoing debate about Mark Jankowski and yes. like the never ending, oh God, hair on fire freak out about that. And even Gaudreau when he, you know, like the concern about him not signing with the Flames. So, you know, the, that's more why I'd be concerned about players going to the NCAA even though it would actually be good for the system to have a few players that will take some time. When I look at Roslovic, I think that it's very unlikely that he falls to 45th. What do you think? I would be somewhat surprised. Unlike Beauvillier, I'd be somewhat surprised if Roslovic made it that far. I, I think 40 would probably be the lowest he would go, but you never know. Yeah, I, th- I don't know. I think if the Flames trade up, he might be a, a guy that we might take. But I think that there's other teams I've heard that are interested in him. And I, get th- I don't think he'll make it out of the 30s myself. Yeah, he could even go in the first round. So Yeah, it's... I could see a team with a couple first-round picks take a flyer on him with the second one if they really like him. Yeah. It's one of those things that the draft is so unpredictable that who knows – like nobody expected Roland McEwen to fall to fifty one last year, and he was sure. rated in the teens. So it, yeah, yeah, I was. It, I was it gets quite a little bit. Him. Yeah, it gets a little bit more unpredictable once you're heading into the forties, fifties, and sixties and beyond. So another player you're thinking the Flames might take, and again, a guy who might even go a lot higher than we think is uh, a centerman. Centerman and right wing, as you've list, listed him, uh, Jaku, Jakub Forsbeka Carlson or Carlson Forsbeka, depending on where you look. You're seeing it in different orders. Uh, he's a six foot one hundred ninety pound defenseman. I've seen him listed in lists as as early as twenty nine and as low as sixty nine. And to me, that's quite a range there. Why do you think we get such a range on this player? Uh, people might see certain things in his game that they don't like and and they might see things that they do like and And can you point out anything that might be troubling about him uh he might not be as good of a two-way player and that might be what drops him in certain rankings he is a very good fast player with good hands a good shot quite accurate he just might be a little bit rough on the defensive side of the game, but that he is going to the NCAA, so that's another one of those players that you might, with the, having three to four years to work on him, I I would expect him being able to try and figure out the problems in his game and figure it out. So you think he might be one of these guys that is maybe a little bit more of a long-term project? Yeah, and he's a right shooting player. Like it, that's why in some places he's listed as a right winger, others as a center. So that would also help to fit a need. The player he reminds me the most of is Jakob Silverberg, uh, who plays with the Anaheim okay. Ducks. Just a solid all around player. I think Forsback has a little bit more high end skill, but he could probably develop into a good second line winger. So you're thinking top six material. Yeah. He has the, the heard, hands for it, for sure. Some of the criticisms I've heard of uh, Forsbacka was his consistency, that people say that he's very hot and cold, 
and he really needs that's the biggest thing he's going to need to work on to be a, a full-time NHLer. Yeah, I can see that. And that when you're getting into the second round and beyond, you're you're going to see things warts on players like lack of consistency or lack of certain skills entirely. So it it really just depends on if it's manageable and like Forsbacka, he does show lots of flashes of brilliance. If he can get consistency in college, then that's not a problem. Yeah, no, I think I think you're right, and I think this is a player who will be well served by going to college and and taking that road. Um, that's probably from this list that we're looking at, probably the major guys who we'd probably take with the 45th pick. Is there anyone else you can think of who is probably would be a top target for 45th? Uh, there is a defenseman that I do really like, and that's Mitchell Vanda Sompel, but we'll get into him after. Sure. So let's move on then. Assume those are kind of the 45th pick candidates, plus anyone who falls out of the first round or the early second round. And after that, the Flames will be making two consecutive picks at at 52 and 53. Um, And the rest of these guys probably fall more into the 52-53 range. So the the first guy we'll talk about there is a winger. He can play either wing, left wing or right wing. And that is uh, Philip All. And Philip All is a six foot four, two hundred and twelve pound winger. Uh, he's ranked generally, from where I've seen him ranked, as about fortieth to fiftieth, uh, maybe sixtieth even on some places. And he's playing in Sweden right now. Matt, what do you like about this kid? Uh, he's big, and he's a good playmaker. Those are the two keys to his game. He's a little bit rough around the edges which is common with players that are larger, not rated in the first round. He's definitely going to be a project three to four years. I don't see him coming into the NHL anytime soon, but anytime you can have a six foot four player that has skill, he's going to be wanted by a lot of teams. It seems to me like I remember this, and I'd have to go back and check, but it seems to me like he has fallen on some lists over the year. I think he was rated by some people as high as like 15th or 16th going into the year and then fell. So yeah. that's, always a, that's always a little disturbing too. Yeah, he's not very quick on his feet either. Like he, he is, It's more like seeing David Wolf skate. So he's okay, it's just it, that needs a lot of work. I've seen a couple of clips of him online, not a whole lot. And one of the things that I have in my notes here that struck me is for a 17 year old player who's six foot four, he seems to have grown into his body well. He seems to understand how to use his frame uh, to play physically, which often we see these kids that are that big, they're, they seem a little bit clumsy in their body. So I thought that was nice to see and that he seems to understand how to use his size to play physically when he needs to. Yeah. And his father actually has the best hockey name ever, Boo All. <laughs> That's a great name, Boo All. Yeah, he was a goaltender on top of it. Um, So this kid, what do you think the probability would be that he'd be available at 45? Oh, he definitely should be. He probably will be as well at 52, 53. And you li- it seems like, based on your review on our website, you're giving him a 2 out of 10 for the 45th pick. Is that just because you think there's better than him out there? Yeah. At 45, yeah. Uh, I think that one of the fallers or one of the other guys that we've l- already discussed would be a better idea. And you only give him a 6 out of 10 for the 52 or 53rd pick. Why not hire? He seems like he's got all the skills needed. Uh, once again, there are better players, uh, especially when once we get into the defensemen. There are quite a few good defensemen. So that's why I'm not quite as high on him, but he is a good player. I can see him potentially going higher than he might normally just because of his size. I think you'll get some GMs that say there's a big kid. I want to have him in our organization. 
Yeah, I could see it. I could even see him going in the 35 range if a team really likes his overall package. It just, uh, for me, talent is number one on my list. And uh, like, I couldn't care if the guy's five foot four if the guy is that good. So, you know what I mean? And in the second round, there are so many very skilled players that I would rather go with one of them than a guy with size. Yeah, no, I agree with you, but I can see some GMs saying, okay, we've got this guy a little bit lower, but let's move him up because of the size. Especially a team like maybe Philadelphia seems to like the big, hawking, you know, boys. Yep, I can agree. Uh, the next player on your list here is uh, a, another Canadian-born guy, another big player, six foot four, 198 pounds, so he's tall but a little bit lanky. Uh, and this is Nicholas Waugh, who this year played in the QMJHL, and he also went to the uh, Canada U18 tournament. What do you think about this kid? Uh, he is Joel Colborn, 2.0. He is identical in pretty much every way. He, I've seen a little bit of his work, again, watching clips online and that sort of thing. Um, I've noticed that he is quite dominant on the forecheck. That was one of the first things I noticed is he always seems to be in the right spot doing what he needs to do to, you know, help his team on the forecheck, which was just the first thing I noticed about him. It's like, wow, this kid knows his role on this team. Yeah. Uh, that's basically what you're getting is another player that's got some skill like Colborn can put the pucks in the net, make a decent pass. It's just that there's not first line upside there. He's just a solid second, third, fourth line guy. So Matt, this is a player that you're not high on going with the 45th pick. Um, and if you look at where he's ranked by scouting services, uh, NHL Central Scouting has him at 45th and TSN has him at 73rd. So it's quite a range there. You feel it looks like that this uh, player is more appropriate to go with the 52-53. You gave him an 8.5 out of 10 uh, for how much you'd like the Flames to use their pick there. Do you think that if he's being rated by the NHL at 73, he'd still be available when we get to the third round? Or if you want him, do you grab him now? Well, with his size and talent, I don't think he would reach 75. He'd probably go around 65-ish if uh, at worst. Like, I don't see him falling much beyond the second round just because of the size. It, and we've seen uh, some teams looking at a guy like Colborn who can put 40 points on the board as a second, third line guy, like it, you're basically getting a clone of Colborn. So with a second round pick, that that would be a good value for a lot of teams. I always find it hard when somebody compares players from another team to guys that we're going to draft because we don't always know that player as intimately as others might. But I think you know, knowing Colborn and knowing how he plays, um, I'd be happy to have another Colborn on the team. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there are some differences, but not enough where like they're completely different from one another. The next player on the list, then, uh, who you're thinking the Flames will probably take with one of those 52 or 53 picks is a left winger, 17-year-old, 5'11 and 185 pounds. He played in the USHL last year for Cedar Rapids, and this is Eric Foley. And there's a player that I've been watching for a while, too. Tell us what we need to know about Eric Foley from your view. He is basically Lance Boma with offensive talent. And, like, I know Lance Boma scored 16 goals this year, but the Lance Boma from last year, so to speak. Like, he has, like, legitimate offensive skill in addition to the all-around crash-and-bang two-way play. Interesting. So, yeah, that's what I've kind of seen when I've been watching him, too, is he, he definitely seems like he's not afraid to use his body. He knows his role on the team well. He's not one of these guys that just seem to have fallen into that role. He knows what he has to do, um, you know, to win a hockey game. And, yeah, I think Boma or, yeah, Boma's a good comparison there. Um, this is a guy who's ranked roughly around the 50s. Is that generally, do you think, because he's just looked at as kind of the enforcer role? 
well, he, how would you say, he doesn't have a, as high end of talent as some of the guys that are rated in the 1 to 50 range. So I can understand why, because like, he's likely going to be a third line player in the NHL if he develops. So I don't know if teams would w really want to use a higher pick in a draft okay. like this, but he does have offensive skill to him in addition to being a pain to play against. So he would fit the Flames mantra for sure. And he's heading to Providence as well, so he'll be playing with Jankowski next year. Yeah, so he's going to Providence of the NCAA. My worry with this guy is for him to kind of play that agitator role, which is what Boma's been playing and what he's done so well so far at 5'11", I'm not sure how well he can play that role at the NHL level. What do you think? Well, I've also seen him rated at six feet, so it he is on the short side to play that role, but I can definitely understand what you're saying. It's just he is a quality all-around player, and he does kind of fit the Flames style, so I could see the Flames using a pick on him. And I think if they were to use the 52nd or 53rd pick, that would be an appropriate pick to use on him as well. Yeah. Like, I don't see... Like, honestly, if he was, we had, like, the, say, 65th overall pick, I'd probably go elsewhere with 52 and 53 and hope he fell to 65. But 75, that's just too far. He'll be gone. Definitely think you're right. And, yeah, I mean, he's rated to go. He's rated about 50th, so if we were to take him with 52 or 53, that seems like a good use of it. That's really the end of the forwards at this round, and the rest of the players that we're going to be talking about, at least here in round, at least here in round two, are all defensemen. And it seems to me, when I look at the list, there seems to be this big chunk of defensemen that are all ranked about 40 through about 65. Yeah. And they're all more or less the same types of players, by and large. There are some variations, though. And this is one of the ones that you really liked from that list, and that's uh, defenseman Mitch Van de Sample. And he is uh, 5'10", 183 pounds from London, Ontario, and he played for the Oshawa Generals last year. And if you take a look at your review on the website, you think he's... 10 out of 10 for your interest in the Flames taking him no matter where in this round. What do you like so much about this defenseman? Well, he also plays forward as well. So oh, really? he is versatile. He's very quick, very good offensively. He's sort of like Kylington, but short. And in the offensive way, anyway. Uh, if you look at players like Sammy Vatnin and uh, Tori Krug, He's basically that kind of a guy. Just a very good dynamite offensive defenseman. He is only five foot ten, so I would be somewhat surprised if he was taken before forty five just because of teams not wanting a really short defenseman, but his skill is just that high that I don't see that being a problem. So you're pretty much saying if he's on the board, take him. Yeah. That's the way that you're looking at him, is this is a guy that if he's available, uh, you should definitely add him to your organization. Pretty much. like I, The only way I would pass on him is if uh, either Forsbacca or Beauvillier was on board, or one of the fallers from the first round. Now the NHL Central Scouting is ranking him about 34th. Um, do you think that the possibility of him being there at 45 or even lower is realistic uh yeah because of the fact that his height it, if he was six foot he would be in the middle of the first round it's just that because he's so short and teams do shy away from shorter players even if they are really good and he got he got 63 points this last year as a defenseman and forward too so that's nice to know that he's quite high scoring for an ohl player yeah exactly and he was part of the memorial cup team as well so that's good yeah, he's actually he's listed on the uh, OHL website as defenseman. Do you know how much he's actually been playing forward? Has it just been in emergency situations? Uh, he slides up if they need to, basically. Uh, okay. Like if they're needing a goal or something, he does occasionally slide up. 
He's more of a rover type. Can definitely pinch up, no problem. A lot of interesting possibilities there. Uh, so the next defenseman, then another, again, another defenseman and a long string of defensemen we're going to talk about is Matthew Spencer. Matt Spencer is a six foot two, two 203-pound defenseman. He has a right shot. He's a Canadian boy, and he played for the Peterborough Peets of the OHL. Um, this is a guy who you're quite high on. You you think that the Flames should definitely pick him. You gave him a 9 out of 10 at the 45th spot and a 10 out of 10 for the 52nd or 53rd spot. What is so impressive about Matt Spencer? Uh, tools, basically. Like If you look at the player that we drafted last year, Brandon Hickey, he was playing in a nobody league, really, and he had all the raw tools needed, and once he went to the NCAA, he performed very well. Uh, the Pete, Peterborough Peets are a terrible team offensively, and he his stats aren't very good, but he also did lead the, the whole team's defense core in scoring and that included a player that Dominic Mason who was selected 35th overall it's he has a lot of what you need in a defenseman he's good defensively he's relatively quick he can make a good outlet pass he has a decent shot he's six foot two so like there's all the things that you would like in a defenseman it's just that his stats suck because he's playing on a bad team and that can sense her draft position as well. Yeah, because if you look at, like, say, uh, Vanda Slumpel, like, it, he had over 60 points, where I think uh, Spencer only had about 25 to 30. And NHL Central Scouting ranks him at 68, um, and you think that's a lot just because he's playing for a bad team? Yeah, pretty much. Like, I've seen him in the 40s as well, so it depends on where you're looking at. I wouldn't mind, like, if the Flames can walk away with him in any of the three picks, I would be pleased. Yeah, no, he seems, like, I haven't seen a lot of him, but just what I'm reading through today in preparation for this, he seems definitely like a player who uh, could be interesting here. And, you know, not everybody needs to be a high-scoring defenseman, and I think he might be one of these guys who, at the NHL level, it seems, might become more of that defensive defenseman. Yeah. The next guy on your list here to talk about, another defenseman, is Galume Brisebois, um, a player who's been playing the last year in the QMJHL for Acadia Bathurst Titans. He's 17, and he's six foot two, 176 pounds. And again, you're very high on him, it sounds like. You gave him an 8 out of 10 for how much you like the Flames. Sorry, 8.5 out of 10 for how much you like the Flames. Take him with one of their picks in the 50s. Why so high on him, but where is he lacking compared to the last two that we talked about? Uh, he, his shot isn't very good. He only had four goals. Um, actually, his stat line is pretty much the exact same as TJ Brody's back when he was drafted. He had, Brody had two more assists in his draft year. Uh, other than that, though, he, he is pretty much a virtual clone of Brandon Hickey. So... A lot of the same tools, very good at passing the puck, good skater, decent defensively. He's a project just like Spencer is, but there's enough tools there that you can help put it all together. And I think by the 52nd and 53rd pick, I'm expecting that the guy we take is a bit of a project. Yeah, as long as they have enough of the tools in the toolbox then it's a good thing. And like a last year, this guy would have been, and Spencer probably would have been taken in the 35 to 40 range. So they're good players. It's just, you know, they will have some things to work on. That's all. Yeah. And I think that's definitely reasonable for a second round pick. We won't talk about these guys each. Um, I think we have enough information here, but another set of guys that you identified for that 52nd and 53rd pick, again, defensemen, Jeremy Lausanne, Noah Juleson, Nicholas Milos, and Rasmus Anderson. And what makes these four defensemen stand out to you? They're, well, uh, I'll split them into two groups. Lausanne and Juleson, they're more or less the same caliber and types of players that Spencer and Brisebois are. But they're just not quite as good 
as the other two guys. Um, Juleson, he reminds me at times of Watherspoon, but not quite as good. So it, they're all right. There's nothing wrong with them. If the Flames picked them, that would be perfectly fine. Uh, Milos, I don't like particularly. Uh, he tends to make defensive miscues regularly. Like, he's a really good offensive defenseman. He's six foot three, and I think 210 or something like that. 205, and he's been rated quite highly. Um, hockeyprospect.com ranks him 29th, and Future Considerations ranks him 43rd, and he's 40th in, uh, by Central Scouting among North American skaters. So a lot of people quite like yeah, this kid. It, the reason is uh, his foot speed isn't quite good enough, and that like he does make bad decisions, and that gets him out of position, and he doesn't have the foot speed to correct his mistakes and that leads to goals against so uh, and do you think that's something that can be trained like could the you know if the flames took him do you think they could coach him and work with him on that to get it where it needs to be it's a possibility but with the amount and talent the amount of other talented players i would likely go in a different direction just because of the fact that you know if you take say spencer and breezebois you're getting a lot of the same offensive tools but you're also getting the speed and defensive abilities where milos you're getting the offense but not so much on the defense it's okay. just how do you say milos could be a very good top pairing defenseman if he figures it out but there's also a greater risk that he'll just flame out entirely, where Spencer and Breezebois oh. are less less high of a ceiling, but less likely to bust out right. Okay, makes sense. So let's do what we did last week. Um, you are the Flames general manager in Sunrise, Florida. Your name is called for the 45th overall pick, and you have all the players that we've talked about. You have... Beauvillier, you have Roslovic, you have uh, Carlson Forsbecka, you have Philip All, Nicholas Juan, Eric Foley on the board. Who do you call to be the next Calgary Flame? I would go with Jakob Carlson Forsbecka with my pick. Okay. Uh, I like his offensive talent. He's as good as the other guys. It's just th- there's a better overall package with him, it seems, than the other guys, and... That would be my pick. Mind you, if it, yeah, if Forsbacca wasn't, it would be a toss up between Roslovic and Beauvillier, and I'd probably go with Roslovic. Okay, good to know. And then you are again called by Gary Bettman to make the fifty second and fifty third pick, and we'll pick from uh, Van de Sample, uh, Matthew Spencer, Brisebois. Um, of those three, and he, let's even throw in uh, Milos there. Who do you take 52nd and 53 of those four? Well, I would probably go with Spencer and Brisebois, even though Van de Sompel, it, it would be a toss up between those three, really. Um, okay. I'd probably take Sompel and one of Spencer and Brisebois, whichever was the opinion was better of at the time. Because they're both the same height, and they both have the same general abilities, so it's more like what... Like, that would basically come down to interviews and how the player interviewed with the team more so than anything. So it sounds like the second round we're expecting to be very defensive heavy for the Flames. Yeah, and realistically, with any of those players other than maybe Milos, I wouldn't... Like, if the Flames walked away with three of those players that we talked about, I'd be perfectly happy with any of them, any combination of. Excellent. That's good to know. Well, it sounds like we've got a strong uh, strong top 60 ahead of us yeah, this year. Yeah, and the thing is that uh, there's also a possibility of players falling because, like, we didn't talk about a lot of guys that are more likely to go in the 30-ish to 35 range, like a guy like Philippe Schlappick who could easily fall. So it depends. You know, it depends on, like, if any of those guys 
say like the, the top 12 in the first round if one of those guys fell well you'd throw whichever that you were planning on picking and looking at whether or not one of those guys is going to work for you instead well of course you always want to take the best player on the board um, but I guess you also have to ask yourself how realistic is it that a guy who's in the 30s falls to 45. I find normally those guys ranked in the 30s generally are taken by about 40. It just depends. Like uh, I know like Beauvillier, he's rated r- like right around the beginning of the second round, but because of his height, he might fall. Same with Van de Sempel. So it depends. Like anything. We will find we'll find out on June twenty seventh exactly what the Flames decide to do and what interesting choices they may have to make when it comes to those uh, three second round picks. Yep. In the third round, the Flames have two choices. They have their own seventy sixth selection and they have the eighty third selection, which came from Washington in the Glen Cross deal as well. Um, we're not going to go into a lot of players this far down in the draft, but there's two guys you did want to highlight for the 76 selection who you were interested in. One is uh, centerman right winger uh, who's born in Richmond, BC, Glenn Godden, and he played for the Swift Current Broncos last year. What do you like about this player, man? He's a solid two-way player. He's primarily been a center. He's good defensively. There's not a lot of offense. He He's okay. Uh, there's nothing wrong with him offensively. He's just not flashy. He's more of a boring player, more like Jansen Harkins, which we talked about last week. It, he reminds me a bit of like a Stajan type of player, just solid all the way around, not any real deficiencies in his game, just good. And the other guy I wanted to point out for the 76th pick potentially is Gabriel Gagne, Who's a tall, lanky centerman? He's six foot five, hundred and eighty eighty seven pounds, and he played for the Victoriaville Tigers of the QMJHL. What do you like about this kid? He is Brian Burke's player personified, truculence to the T. And like with the third round pick, either at seventy six or eighty three, if you can get a six foot five guy who can skate well, like Gagne. It's more or less like the Hunter Smith pick from last year. Just another physical, big, hulking forward that has no problem hitting anything that moves. And you would you think that he would be available kind of at the 76th pick, or do you think you'd maybe use the 83rd on him? Where do you rank it, him in that uh, third round? It's an either-or. I, I think he sh- could be available at either pick. So it, he, I've seen him rated at around 90 95 so it wouldn't be out of line if he went earlier like at 76 because that's when like the board kind of gets thrown out the window so but Mm. you know if you can get another big hulking truculent player to fit the system that doesn't hurt at all and that's about as far as we're going to go talking about individual players but just so everyone knows Uh, The other picks the Flames have, they have no fourth-round pick. That was traded to San Jose in exchange for TJ Galliardi. And they have their own fifth-round pick at 136. They have their own sixth-round pick at 166. And their own seventh-round pick at 196. And this pick, I'd say even around the third round, like you were mentioning with Gagne, is where you might start taking some risks here. Um, Matt, are there any hidden gems any players later on that you might think for round three four five that might kind of be the diamond in the rough the johnny goudreau sort of player who gets taken in the fourth round and everybody wonders how he ended up going so low uh well there's a lot of players unfortunately slash unfortunately that have some talent there's nobody as good as goudreau because i think everybody learned their lesson that you know, a player of Gaudreau's stature is able to play at the NHL level quite effectively. So they would probably be rated in the second round this go around, but there's nobody exactly like that this time. But uh, there are a couple of players like Sebastian Aho, who's expected to go in the sixth round, who's an offensive defenseman from Sweden, and he's five foot ten. I think he's been passed over before, but. 
you know, it, he might be worth taking a flyer on in the sixth or seventh. Do you expect the Flames to take a goaltender in one of those later rounds? All of our prospect goalies are kind of moving up and ready for the pros. Do you think we need to restock the coverage there? I would probably skip this year. Like, normally I'm a, a fan of selecting a goalie every year until you find your starting, good starting goaltender. Like, a, you know, like a Jonathan Quick or a Henrik Lundqvist. Once you get that, then you don't need to pick a goalie for another, like, five to seven years. But it, the Flames they have too many question marks if they took a goalie fine I, I can't really complain it's just having three top end goalie prospects as it sits now I think that's good for a year and like revisit it next year to see how those guys are progressing yeah I, I don't disagree I think that you know by the time you get to the sixth seventh round pretty much all the goalies are about the same caliber so i think whether you take one this year or next year is not really going to matter all that much yeah and next year like if the flames want to use a third or a fourth on a guy like if they really like him fine but i it's not a high priority it's like if the flames found themselves in a position to draft a left winger it's like yeah but we already have a bunch of those so you know, is there a similar player that's a position that we do need? Then maybe that might be the way to go. Last year, going into the entry draft, the, I guess, buzzword, if you will, seemed to be truculence. Brian Burke was making the selections last year. He was still the interim general manager. Um, we knew what kind of player we were expecting out of a Brian Burke draft, and it was that truculent, you know, big hockey player. This year, we're not really sure what sort of a player to expect. Do you expect that in those third through seventh rounds, you're going to see a lot of organizational need, a lot more defensemen taken? What kind of a player do you think the Flames need to be taking with those low picks? It, well, like if you look in past the past couple of years, like we've seen a, like last year, Adam Olas Matson, he's a big six foot four defenseman. And we saw Austin Carroll taken in the seventh. I really like Austin Carroll. Oh, so do I. And he's a big physical forward, much in the Boma and Tim Harrison type mold. The year prior, we took Harrison in the sixth, and he's a six foot three banger type def uh, forward. We also took Rafikoff, who's a big defenseman in the seventh round. John Gilmore is more of an offensive guy, like Sebastian Ajo, who I mentioned earlier. That's the same kind of guy. And even if you look the next year, we have the uh, Kulak-Kalkin uh, pairing. Coda Gordon was taken in the sixth. I still think Coda Gordon might have some talent in him. Yeah, it's one of those things that it really depends, but... Like, even in 2010, we got Michael Furland in the fifth round. So, like, if there's a really top-notch third, fourth-line guy that's profiling in that direction, I could see the Flames going in that way. Or if there's a high-end defenseman that, like, say, like, there's a good Russian defenseman like Igor Rykov, and he's available in 5, 6, or 7, I could see the Flames going in that direction. If you're the GM, would you be picking the best available from your list, or would you be going organizationally for need at this point? A little bit of A, a little bit of B. Like, if your picks are between, like, a center and a defenseman, we don't really need a center. We do need a defenseman, if they're close. So, like, if it's, like, your number one and your number two on your list, well, go with the, the need first. But you also have to remember that most of the Flames' prospects have graduated from the junior ranks now. Like, we only have, like, four good prospects that are not in the AHL or headed in that direction, like guys like Kanzig and that. So we only have Jankowski, Rafikoff, McDonald, and uh, Hickey that are top-notch players that are still in the developmental stage. So the Flames are going to need players that will fit the roles like three, four years from now as well. So that's why it wouldn't be a terrible thing if the Flames ended up taking a whole bunch of project picks regardless of position all through the draft. 
Yeah, we'll see where it goes. I think these are the hardest rounds to predict, so I think all we can do is wait till the 27th and see what the uh, what the Flames lineup looks like after that. Yeah, and like I, I would expect at least one big defenseman in five, six, seven, and likely one physical player as well, with whichever being you know the the third is the wild card, I think so. Yeah, and you know, I could also see the Flames not using at least one of those five, six, seven picks and potentially moving it in some sort of a package either now before the draft or at the draft. Yeah, I could see that. Like if they say like they like somebody in the fourth round and he's still on the board, I could see them packaging say five five and six to get the fourth round pick or it might be packaged to get some higher you know maybe they want to move out of the second round into the late third and they're packaging a second and a fourth and a player for that there's lots of options there but yeah i could definitely see them taking a fifth round pick or sixth or seventh and packaging them up somewhere and shipping them out um on that vein matt are there any of these picks that you would expect to be traded is there any pick you look at that you go Huh, I you know, I wouldn't really at all be surprised if we didn't see this pick made. Yeah, honestly, I, this is a such a deep draft that I am actually hoping that the Flames can add more picks in the top 90. And like that might even mean trading down in the first round depending on what's on the board. Like if you know, like all the good players from the top 11, top 12 and maybe even the couple of guys like Connor that we talked about last week are gone, and you have five or six players that are basically even on your list, might make sense to trade down to get another pick just because there are so many good players this year. Yeah, I think you got to be really careful too because there's so many good players. I think that the trade value is going to be quite high to move up. Yeah, and... That's why, like, like on Calgary Puck, I've tossed out the idea of trading down 21 to pick up number 51 from Buffalo as a possibility. Another person said that Ottawa has 18 and 42. That might work, although I think we'd have to add. So, you know, everything, it just depends on what happens on draft day because you never know. Like, a guy like uh, Matthew Barzal might fall to 15, and okay, well, I'm not trading that pick. So, yeah, you just don't know. No, and that's what makes draft day so interesting. Yeah, especially picking in the middle of the round. There are so many good players above and below that pick that it really just depends on what's on the board. Well, with that said, and having finished up looking at the Calgary Flames for this draft, um, the big question this year is who goes number one. And I thought it'd be fun to step back from the Flames a little bit. Matt, if you are uh, the Edmonton Oilers, you're walking up onto the stage to make yet another first overall pick. Whose name do you call? Peter Chiarelli puts an Oilers jersey on who? Nick David. Honestly, if I was selecting, I would possibly go with Eichel, but... It'd be a toss-up, but yeah, I don't see any way that the Oilers walk away from McDavid. I personally like Eichel better as a player. Same here. Um, But yeah, I think the hype says it has to be McDavid. The only way I could see them doing that is for Edmonton and Buffalo to swap, and Edmonton gets some out of that swap. So Edmonton and Buffalo swap one and two. Yeah, and like a decent, like say like Joel Armia goes to Edmonton for the swap or something like yeah, that. Yeah, or maybe a second or third round pick, you never know. Yeah. Um, But yeah, I agree with you. I think that by consensus, by hype, all that stuff, it has to be McDavid number one. Uh, if you were Buffalo going up to make the second pick, is Eichel the given pick there? Yeah, like uh, whoever Edmonton picks, take the other guy. Uh, simple as that they have the easiest time there because it you know whoever is on the board take them and then when the phoenix or sorry the arizona coyotes uh hit the stage for third 
Um, this is one that has a lot more debate over who they're going to take. And uh, the final rankings pretty much have Noah Hannafin, a defenseman, at third, Mitch Marner at fourth, Dylan Strom at fifth. Um, who would you take if you were the uh, Coyotes going up to make that pick? Well, Phoenix or Arizona has a lot of good young defensemen, but they don't have a lot of flashy forwards. And the flashiest player outside number one, number two is Mitch Marner. And that's who I would take. Yeah, I can see that. I think if if we didn't have the pressure that everyone has to take McDavid, I think the smart pick for the Oilers would be to take Hannafin because they need the defenseman. Yeah, but they would get trashed mercilessly. Oh, they would. It would have almost been better to make that pick, then fire your GM and bring Torelli in. Yeah. Um, well, it, it would be more make more sense to trade down the third uh, if you're gonna true. take Hannafin and uh, get yeah. a whole shitload of stuff and yeah it's true I also think personally I like Lawson Kraus um I've watched him play a few times he's ranked by most people about sixth or seventh I could see him going as high as fifth in this draft I think that he might be a little underrated yeah I like Kraus as well. Uh, it's rare to get a big guy with skill, and yeah. he does. And and really, I mean, him and Strom are both, you know, both big guys, but I like Kraus a little bit better than I like Strom. Yeah, well, Kraus plays more of a bulldog-style game where Kraus is more, or Strom's more of a finesse-type player, a little bit more. So, like... You know, I it's more like taking Lucic versus, say, like a Monaghan-ish type. Yeah, it just depends on what your organizational need is and what you think you can get away with, that sort of thing. Yeah. Well, Matt, this is our last show before the NHL entry draft. This year's draft takes place June 26th and 27th in Sunrise, Florida. It's being hosted by the uh, Florida Panthers, your second favorite NHL team. And as usual, the first round will be on TV on the 26th. You can catch it on TSN Friday night. And the 27th is not televised. I think the NHL Network might actually carry it, but I'm not sure. Uh, do, you, do you know for sure if they're going to be carrying that? Well, they usually do, but it's usually them interviewing random players and... Oh yeah, it's not it's not very interesting to watch. They don't use the stage or anything after that. It's just teams sitting at their table and they call the name via telephone. So if you do want to watch the draft, uh, find a sports bar, grab your couch at home on the 26th. Likely the Flames will have some sort of event at Flame Central. They usually do for the draft, so that's also a thing. Yeah, the Flames have there's lots of bars around town. Do some Hudson's usually has a party and that sort of thing. So. Uh, wherever you went to watch the playoffs, go watch the draft there. And then we will be back shortly after the draft to talk about uh, what the Flames did on the 26th and 27th, what the new crop of prospects look like, and also to preview the July 1st unrestricted free agency day. And hopefully by that point, we're going to have a lot more information on who's staying, who's going, and who might be targets for the Flames. Yeah, and especially like over the next week and a half, two weeks, uh, more of the RFAs will get signed, potential UFAs might get signed, and you'll start hearing floating rumors because now teams are able to talk to players before July 1st. So, who knows? We'll be previewing all that, though, right after the draft. Yeah, we'll probably be back uh, the 29th or 30th. We're going to shoot for uh, recording on the 29th and getting to show it on the 30th. So we're there before July 1st. But uh, before we go for the last time, I promise it'll be the last time that we will annoy you guys about this. Uh, we want to make sure that everybody takes our 2015 Fireside Chat audience survey. Uh, this is a survey that we're asking everybody to do. This gives us valuable feedback from our audience on things that you like, things that you want us to improve, things that maybe we're not doing that you'd like to see us do. Uh, it covers the show, the, the website, all sorts of different topics. So if you've got 10, 15 minutes this week, that's all it's going to take. Uh, go take the survey. You can get to it either at firesidechat.ca uh, or you can go and you'll see it if you go there. It's the second post down on the page. Or you can go to firesidechat.ca survey to get to it directly. 
And if you fill that out, we will enter you into a cool draw for a prize. We're going to make the draw right before the entry draft. We'll announce it on Facebook and Twitter, and we'll let you know the winners here, or the winner, I should say, here on the show uh, in on our next show. But if you give us your name and email address at the end of the survey, which is totally optional, but if you do, we'll enter you to win a prize pack that includes a Fireside Chat t-shirt, a Flames baseball cap, a Fireside Chat can cooler, uh, some temporary tattoos, some Calgary Flames logo stickers, a Flames bag, and a collectible 2013 Reading Give It a Shot program complete set of bookmarks. So make sure you go fill that out before the entry draft. Uh, we'll be drafting or we'll be pulling that name just shortly before uh, the entry draft, probably on the 25th. So get that in and hopefully you're going to win. And Matt, I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to see who wins that contest. We've had a lot of great entries since we started announcing this. Yeah, it, whoever wins it will be getting quite the nice swag bag from us, and I look forward to announcing who's the lucky winner. And, you know, we want to put together a good bag of stuff, but I think that we've got quite neat prizes in there. Um, the Can Cozy, I don't know about you, I wear a ton of baseball caps. The Flames baseball cap would be really cool. And that bookmark set, that's that's quite a collectible piece right there. Yep, lots of fun stuff. It is. So, Matt, we will talk to you uh, right before the free agent season opens and enjoy watching the draft. I'm sure knowing you, you'll be all over Twitter as the Flames are making their picks. Oh, yeah. It'll be fun. I can't wait. Hopefully the Flames make some big splashes between now and then. It'd be great if we walk into the draft with an extra pick or a new roster player. Something like that would be quite cool. Yep. It'll be fun. Have a good week, and I'll talk to you right after the draft as we preview free agency. Fireside Chat is edited by Mike Crosby and Brett Bauer. This show is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license information, visit firesidechat.ca.